and uh, we culminated uh, by going to Memphis on uh, Monday, April 2nd, and I want to thank again, as I have previously, uh, Delta Airlines for providing a charter plane for us to go to Memphis, and on April the 3rd, uh, we had an opportunity uh, to be in the same spot, same church uh, that my father spoke from uh, in, in Memphis. That was a very, uh, believe it or not, Pam, that was a very intimidating moment standing in that, uh, that pulpit that my father last uh, spoke from. Uh, but I thank God for uh, that opportunity. And we came back here on yesterday and had a full day of events starting with our non, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Nonviolent Peace Prize, which we awarded uh, to two attorneys, um, attorney Benjamin Ferenz, who uh, happens to be the last living prosecutor of the Nimburg Nazi trials, a 99 Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative. Uh, Brian Stevenson has done a lot of work as it relates to representing uh, those who've been marginalized in the criminal justice Senate, Senate, uh, system. Uh, he actually won a Supreme Court ruling, removing mandatory sentences for, uh, life sentences for juvenile delinquents, uh, which I think is very significant. Um, and then finally, in April, uh, the end of April, he will be opening a museum in Montgomery, Alabama, where the movement began, uh, entitled From Enslavement to Mass Incarceration, and connecting all of the dots um, between enslavement through mass incarceration. And there will be a special memorial there, which is the first and only in this nation to lynching. Um, and so I think it's gonna be one of the most powerful, transformative, um, um, museums that we have in this uh, nation and, and looking at that very dark history uh, that uh, we lived through as a nation and hopefully we will learn some very vital and important lessons so that we will not repeat it um, again and so uh, after that we had a special um, luncheon with them and and then, uh, in the afternoon, we had a ceremony where we took um, a gun and uh, had it um, uh, burned and turned into shovels. And um, they also turned them into artwork. It was a very interesting experience for me because I was the one that had to carry the gun. I don't like guns. I uh, grew up in a house without guns. I am literally afraid of guns, um, but that was a very powerful and healing moment um, for me uh, as we looked at um, the impact of gun violence on those of us um, who have lost loved ones uh, that way, including some of our mothers and um, other family members. And then yesterday evening, we rang bells at 7.01 p.m. in Atlanta, 6.01 p.m., which was the exact time uh, that my father was shot, assassinated from the balcony of the Lorraine Motel there in Memphis, Tennessee, and afterward, uh, me and uh, my two brothers, their wives, my niece, Yolanda Renee, um, and the rest of the King family uh, laid a wreath at my father's tomb, and then I left there and went to the SELC Women's um, Drum Major for Justice Dinner where they honored me with uh, that award. And so I have uh, tired myself out. Um, and today we had some other events that we participated in as well, and now we're here. Um, this is an important moment in our nation. And uh, one of the ways that I believe we're going to be able to overcome some of the divide uh, that we're experiencing, uh, particularly as it relates to race, is that we have to begin to have some very serious, hard, 
difficult and courageous conversations. Um, and we have to put some things on the table. We have historically sought to avoid these kinds of conversations. But I thank God um, for the Black Lives Matter movement for really forcing us uh, to look at uh, this issue, to force us to do what Daddy said, to deal with the last vestiges of racism. Um, one of those areas just happens to be one of the most critical areas has to do with institutional and systemic racism. And so, 51 years ago, my father published his uh, last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. And in that book, he talked about three things that he felt threatened our humanity. He called them the triple evils of poverty, racism, and militarism. In some instances, he called it racism, militarism, and extreme materialism. He saw them not as separate and distinct from each other, but he saw them interconnected and intertwined. He knew that if we did not deal with the issue of how we see each other and how we treat each other, it would be very difficult to overcome these evils. He especially felt that as long as we were more of a thing-driven society rather than a person-centered society, these giant triplets would be almost impossible to overcome. And so tonight we're going to explore those relationships and in particular, look at the issue of racism. He left us with something that I think is the crux of the matter. When he said, we live in this world house, different cultures, different religions, different experiences, and somehow, because of technology and science, we've got to find a way to move beyond just creating a neighborhood, which technology and science has done. But we have to find a way to create a true brother and sisterhood. That we have to find a way to overcome the chasm between our technological and scientific advancements and our moral and ethical advancements. And he said, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or together we will be forced to perish as fools. God forbid that happen. And I'm very hopeful because I feel that there is a new energy in the atmosphere. There's a new generation that is determined to not let us do business as usual. And so tonight, um, I want to thank uh, John Powell and jo George Lakey, who will join in this discussion with me, and our moderator, Joshua Dubois. And I want to thank Joshua and his organization values partnerships uh, for supporting us as we prepared for the last uh, year for uh, these 50th anniversary um, events. I also want to thank uh, our partners for this event, the Center for Civil and Human Rights and the Racial Equity Institute. I'd like to thank our main sponsor, PepsiCo, and at this Point, and I think 
I'm still doing this, Benita Sarah. Um, I'd like to call up the sponsors who have representatives here to make comments. Jordan Ryan from the Carter Center, Lee Sintel from the U.S. Civil Rights Trail, and Rita Brock from Volunteers of America, Jen Graham from Civic Dinners. If they would come um, up at this moment and uh, say a few words. And so, this is the beginning. Tomorrow is their coming. Um, we were going. We are going to uh, break through societal silos. Participants in tomorrow's symposium will have a chance to develop ideas in a cross-sector environment. And the desired outcome is that these collaborations will generate ideas about how to build power to make the changes necessary to move our communities forward. We will collect feedback for a white paper statement to the public about where we stand in this moment. So each of you are warmly welcome to return for that tomorrow. It begins at 7 a.m. with breakfast and will conclude at 5 p.m. on tomorrow evening. Thank you again, and please uh, welcome Jordan. We also welcome Jordan Ryan, Vice President for Peace Programs, the Carter Center. Well, first, Dr. King, uh, you think you're tired, but I am so glad you've got the energy, the passion, the drive that inspires us. Uh, today, you're right. Uh, a very special.
joining us on the live stream. We have thousands of folks tuning in on Facebook um, from around the country. Y'all turn around, look at that camera and wave at them. Hey, everybody. <laughs> We're glad to have you here and joining us virtually in this conversation. Also want to acknowledge the Reverend Dr. Alveda King, Dr. King's niece and a board member of the King Center who's here with us today. We're going to have a great conversation about the triple evils, um, both as Dr. King um, described them uh, to us in the state of those evils and the movement to fight them uh, today. And we have some legendary, I don't say that word lightly, but some legendary uh, panelists who are going to be joining us. And I want to introduce them. The first you've, we've already heard from, and it's such an honor to be here with her, a minister of the gospel, a minister of reconciliation, a force for justice and human dignity, both here in the Atlanta community, in our country, and around the world, and the CEO of the King Center. We're going to give her a little bit of a break in the conversation because she is tired, y'all, after having done all that she's had to do over these last uh, few days. And our prayers and our support and our arms are wrapped around her. But please join me in acknowledging and welcoming uh, to the panel the Reverend Dr. Bernice A. King. Also want to welcome now Dr. John A. Powell. Um, John Powell, you know, like I said, I don't use the word legendary lightly. Um, he is really one of the country's leading voices on civil rights, civil, civil liberties, and issues relating to race, poverty, and the law. He currently runs the UC Berkeley Haas Institute for a fair and inclusive society. Sounds like a beloved community, a fair and inclusive society. He was also the executive director of the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at The Ohio State University. He's taught at more law schools than I can list or count. Um, he's been an international human rights fellow, a national legal director for the ACLU, um, and has been uh, for decades at the forefront of movements for civil and human rights. Join me in welcoming Dr. John Powell. And last but certainly not least, we have George Lakey. Now, he's a Quaker, and Quakers aren't good at bragging on themselves, but I'm going to brag on them a little bit. Uh, uh, George is an activist, a sociologist, a writer, a person who literally, and I'm going to ask him about this, wrote the manual for nonviolent direct action used by many in the civil rights movement when he was training director for Freedom Summer. Um, in so many movements for social change from the 1950s until today, George Lakey has been at the center of them, behind the scenes, just working uh, for justice and civil rights. And we're going to ask him about that legacy and that history and his current work today. George, join me in welcoming George Lakey. So friends, we're going to get into our discussion now, uh, learning more about the lives and stories of some of the folks to my right, and then coming out to you all for conversation and Q&A. Um, so let's get going. I'm going to join you over here. I'm going to get my mic. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Oh, and by the way, um, George uh, has written a book, and I'm, and I'm, I'm emphasizing that I love the title, Viking Economics. We're going to be asking him about that as well. <laughs> all righty. Well, friends, let's get started. Um, this is obviously a very important moment in our country's history. Yesterday was a deeply important day. Um, we've seen the news coverage. Thank you, Dr. King, for um, leading a national conversation about your father's legacy um, and, and helping to remind folks of the importance of the leg his legacy and your mother and its relevance today. But I have a question for you all, and, and that's, would love your sense of what is it about Dr. King's life that people often miss, whether it's you know his um, philosophy, ideology, or or um, the, the, his life it, itself. What do you want to most remind people about him? And would love for the panel to react to that question. Yeah. Can I go first? Sure. Uh, he inspired me to. Uh, to get you know to go to jail as he did so many people and that's uh, that sit in uh, ins uh, moved me to the place where I could actually appreciate how edgy he was, mm. how unwilling he was to be in a comfort zone, but constantly pushing out, pushing out, pushing out, 
And uh, one example of that that I'm aware of is the, those early sermons that he preached about the American dream and how black people should be part of the American dream. And by the time of the 1963 March on Washington, of course, it was, I have a dream. It was actually not a bigger dream. It was a bigger dream, actually, than the American dream was at that time. And it was making more space, being more on the edge. And that was the rest of his career as well, moving into the uh, opposition of the Vietnam War. And then the Poor People's Campaign, always stepping out, always stepping beyond. And that hugely inspired me, and I think has inspired many people, no doubt, the people here. Uh, I wish it would inspire more people in our country to not be, uh, feel, not feel stuck with what we've got and then complaining on each other about it, but to realize, ah, when there's a sense of, you know, where, where do we go? Go outward, yeah. expand. The go edging the is pushing, pushing the boundaries. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Dr. Powell. So I think, uh, uh, actually I wrote something on our blog uh, about uh, Dr. King, and one of the things I talked about in the blog was the complexity that we are oftentimes um, invited to flatten or reduce uh, Dr. King. Um, and depends on, and sometimes that flattening, flattening reflects more of us than him. Uh, he was obviously a genius and, and, and just a great, great man and, and uh, leader. He was also growing. Um, we have to remember he, he died when he was 39. He, and if you watch the trajectory of his life, he was getting deeper and more and more profound. Um, and he brought many things to us. Uh, most of them we still haven't learned. So I talk in the blog and I said, King was ready to teach us to become a democracy uh, where all people counted. King was ready to teach us how to make the world a place safe for humans. King was ready to teach us how to connect our faith, our politics, and our lives. We weren't ready to learn. Wow. And I don't think we're still ready to learn. I mean, that's the question. Uh, that's the struggle that we're dealing with today. Um, and if you look at the work of our institute, and this is not a plug for us, but our leading values and pillars are all built on King. So we talk about as you said, it's the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. We talk about the beloved community. We talk about bridging. Uh, we talk about a circle of human concern where all people are part of the circle. Um, uh, and we know these things are, are not easy to grasp, but King's legacy, in some ways, is, is not even a legacy because it's so alive. Uh, it's alive in his daughter. It's alive in, the, in, in all of you. Um, and it's not clear if we will actually embrace his legacy. What is clear to me, that if we don't embrace his legacy, then the future of this country and the future of the world is greatly at risk. Wow. King, the teacher, the philosophical teacher. Yeah. Dr. King, yeah. and, and I think one of the things that um, most people don't realize is that he was a truth seeker in the process of learning. Um, he, he was not afraid uh, to what I call chew the meat and spit out the bones. Uh, as he developed his nonviolent philosophy and methodology, he did so by um, extracting threads of truth uh, from those philosophers and, and theologians that he, he studied. And oftentimes, I think our world is so narrow because many of us are brought up in a certain ideological bent. And we get so wedded to that bent that anything that is different from that, we altogether oppose, resist, and, and don't want to um, consider that there may be something in there, in that, in that person, in, in that teaching that we can uh, extract some truth from. And I think that's why he, would, he appealed to so many people around the globe. He was a Christian, grounded in his faith, but he also transcended his religion in a way that he spoke a universal language. Um, and in this climate now, we, we, we need to embrace more of that because we live, yes, in a much more diverse um, world. And uh, part of that learning that I talked about is really not being afraid um, to learn from something uh, that may be totally opposite from what you were raised in, but there may be something in it 
that you can draw from and incorporate um, in, into your life as, as, a, as a valuable truth. Yeah. King across boundaries, mm -hmm. breaking down these ideological walls. It's, it's, speaking of that, I'd love to, to ask about that global vision a bit. George, you, you, before your work in the civil rights movement, you were active in the Ban the Bomb movement in the 1950s. Dr. Powell, um, you worked in Mozambique and South America and Western Europe. And Dr. King, a, a major part of your work here is making sure that the movement in the United States is connected around the globe. You just returned from from Italy, where she had a private audience with the Pope, by the way. Um, for those for whom it's not apparent why domestic movement should connect to the global context, for those uh, for whom that, that bridge doesn't necessarily make sense, could you build that, that bridge for us? What, wh why, why is it important for us to think not just about the social justice landscape in the US, but also around the globe? Anyone want to take that? And how do they connect? Yeah. In some ways, the connection is so obvious, it's hard to even articulate, but just to say a couple of things, um, and going back to what Dr. King just mentioned, um, one of the things that was amazing about um, the Reverend Dr. King, the other Reverend Dr. King, and I say that because sometimes we talk about him as Dr. King, but we don't ground him in his faith. Yeah. He was a Reverend, he was, and he deeply embraced his faith and lived it. Um, so it wasn't just what he said on Sunday, it's how he lived his life, it's how he, where he went, a letter from a Birmingham jail, where he went when he was lost and confused. He went deep into his religion. Um, and he not only met with kings and high, you know, people of high places, President Johnson, he also met with gang leaders. Um, he understood that there was a relationship, and he talked about us being deeply interconnected. Now, you know, people in the audience, or people listening on, on live stream, if you look at your clothes, if you look at your car, if you look at your watch, you had stuff made from all around the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've had a global economy for a long time, um, and it's hard to imagine what our life would be without that. And what's happening is the world is getting smaller and smaller. And as the world gets smaller and smaller, we understand from economic sense that we have to, it's, it's a good thing to have stuff and, 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 and intelligence and insights from all around the world. But that also means people. Mm. Uh, and so we can't free up stuff to move around the world, but say to people, stay in your place. The United States uh, has something like 600 military bases all around the world. So the military has understood a long time. Right now, we're in a, you know, a, a tussle with China, not just economically, but we're saying the Chinese sea is straits of 60% of the global economy goes through that. And the Chinese are saying it's, it's theirs, and the United States, no, it can't be theirs. The world cannot stand for one country to claim that piece of land, that, that ocean. Um, and so the world is gonna keep getting smaller. And um, you know, one of the things that turned even more people against King was when he said, let me look at Vietnam. So the U.S. interest is recognized as global. Uh, so our concern has to also be global. And what King did that was so profound that we still haven't learned is that it's not enough to have a relationship with people around the world. We have to have the right relationship. And what we're seeing now is a relationship of domination. What sometimes people call it imperialism. Uh, and King was saying, that's wrong. That's a kind of violence itself. That, and he said, I can't just speak about the violence in the United States and forget about the violence that we're visiting upon Vietnam. So he, no, he nominated Thich Nhat Hanh for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so all of us, I think, have to sort of recognize that all of our lives are touched by the entire world. I, I work, last thing, I work with some black banks across the country, including in Cleveland. And, and I said, you know, we sort of, and I took some bankers to China, and uh, black bankers, and, and they're saying, why do we need to go to China? And when they looked at their books, 25% of their portfolio was held by foreign nationals, and most of that was China. So we, we better understand the world and, and try to be in the right relationship with the world if we're gonna have a world. Yeah, yeah. 
can have stuff from around the world and not be concerned with the people. That's profound. Anyone else want to speak to Dr. King's and, global And vision? I just yeah. think, you know, it's something as simple as realizing that uh, America is a microcosm of the world. Um, everybody in here, except maybe those of the First Nation, have their roots in other countries around the world. Um, and, and so we, we can't divide and separate ourselves and not be sensitive to, you know, those roots. It's like cutting off yourself, cutting a piece of yourself a part of, a, 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 from a part of yourself. Um, and, and so uh, I think as my father traveled even more, he understood that internationally. Um, and, but for most of us, I mean, you can, especially in a city like Atlanta, some of our coastal cities, you, you can end up intersecting with people whose ancestors and some, you know, maybe even first generation now, second generation, who come from someplace else around the world. Um, and so we can't ignore that as, as a society. It was like we're trying to wipe out, you know, um, part of our brain mm. and think that, you know, we are Americans first. I would dare say that we're global citizens first. Wow. Yeah. It's not us versus them. We are them in yeah. many ways. George. Can I uh, connect with your earlier point about learning? Mm -hmm. Because another value of being in touch with people around the world is that we can learn from them. And I was particularly struck in my research on Scandinavia that they figured something out that we are still debating about. And that is the relationship between racism and the economic structure. And that's been a, an old debate, right? I remember I've heard Bayard Rustin say so many times in the old day, he was one of my mentors also, that uh, if we don't get this economic structure changed, we're going to have ugly racism in 50 years, he used to say, very as vehemently as he every, everything he said. Um, but here we are 50 years later, and we do indeed. Um, but the, the good news that I bring from Scandinavia is that they did a kind of experiment. That is, they went after, first of all, poverty. They were able to uh, launch people's movements such that they could have nonviolent change and institute uh, a, a system that would eradicate poverty. So the, the Scandinavians pretty much figured out how to abolish poverty. Uh, and then, after they'd done that, they, their... their um, they increasingly got immigrants from countries of color. And so the racism that they inherited, because the white world is racist wherever you could go in the planet, um, you know, that racism came to the surface, right, in response to these, uh, these immigrants that were coming in. So I got excited about that because I, as a young man, I had lived in Norway, and I was wondering, and it, it was blue eyes everywhere, right, when, when I lived there. So the big question for me was, so is there indeed, a, 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 does changing the economic system actually support you to deal with racism? And it turns out it does. And they are actually making greater progress on the racism that has come up in their countries than we are making in ours. Even though they got that very late start, you know, because we've had all this opportunity and haven't used it well, and they, because the, the opportunity structures in their land, for example, free higher education, that right there, you know, and uh, medical care, quality medical care available to all without regard to cost, and um, for, uh, pensions for all, you know, and uh, uh, affirmative action in, into, uh, uh, in, into the uh, economic life and job, free job training. And if a job isn't working out, try something else. It's all free anyway. We, we want to find a way that you can enter this society and really follow your bliss and, you know, and make it. And the results of that is that they're making faster strides on racism. I was just there in August checking it out with the Government Anti-Racism Center, and they're making faster strides than we are. So, uh, so your, your dad was right, say, you're making that connection, right? And, uh, and Byard was right, and, and, and Bernie was right in saying we really have to emphasize that if we're going to tackle racism as well, because if we don't, the racism is just going to persist. 
so we can learn a ton. I'm going to go look into what Norway is doing on these mm -hmm. issues. It feels like Black Lives Matter more in Norway uh, because of these economic um, uh, systems and and policies than they do in, in too many parts of the United States. It's a fascinating uh, point. George, I want to stick with you for a moment and then broaden out to others. Um, you were a trainer for Freedom Summer, I believe, and you wrote something called the Manual for Direct Action that many activists used uh, during and after Freedom Summer, and you're actually, I believe, revising that manual right now, <laughs> and we'll be uh, re-releasing it. I'm curious, what, were, what was your inspiration? What were the texts? What fed into the manual for direct action? Can you talk about the process of creating that in your work in Freedom Summer? And for Dr. Powell and, and Dr. King, would love to know from you your experiences, your texts, what literature, what, what has shaped your philosophy today? Uh, but George, talk to us about the Manual for Direct Action. Yeah. Well, it was an amazing uh, time when, when I was involved in the Civil Rights Movement and a friend of mine also in graduate school at Penn in um, sociology also involved. And we kept saying, you know what's needed is a manual because people are the newbies who keep joining the Civil Rights Movement. It's a period of great expansion are sometimes making mistakes that cost them dearly, even cost their lives. Mistakes that if, if they, they were manual, you know, you wouldn't make some of those mistakes. So we need a manual and surely the civil rights leadership is going to build, you know, is going to do that. And then one day we looked at each other and said, they are way too busy putting out fires, you know, dealing with, mm -hmm. <laughs> dealing with all the daily emergencies that are going on in the movement. They don't have time to sit back and we're the people, in, you know, graduate school is, is Playland, right? I mean, if we're, in terms of time, we're the people with discretionary time. We should write it. And so we did. Even though we were two white boys, we thought, well, you know, it's our contribution, right? And, uh, and then when I ran into civil rights organizers in the South, I said, oh, yeah, we used to call it the first aid handbook. What to do until Dr. King comes. <laughs> So it, we, I'm very grateful that it got used so well there and also then in the anti-Vietnam War movement and subsequent movements. But now it's 50 years later, right? We've learned so much more about nonviolent direct action because there have been a lot of experiments since. And wage yeah. yeah. Dr. Powell, Dr. King, what, what are the source material or experiences? What has shaped your philosophy today? Well. You know, it's, you know, it's hard to really know. I mean, you know, so there's so many things. Uh, uh, my father uh, was also a Christian minister, had a profound impact on me. I grew up uh, in the 50s and 60s, and I, I, I paid attention to uh, King, but also paid attention to the fights with Malcolm and, and, and Stokely and, and W.B. Du Bois, and, uh, and I like to think I continue to learn. More recently, I've been informed by a lot of work around the mind science, how the brain works. Uh, but also economics. But I want to go back to a couple of things that was said. And just one, um, you know, one of my one of my heroes is uh, James Baldwin, and he, he said, um, "There's no hope for them as long as they think they're white." And he wasn't just playing. I think what he was saying, and I, I talk about this in a book I've written called "Racing to Justice," that the very concept of whiteness, as it came out of uh, the Enlightenment project uh, four or five hundred years ago, was uh, a concept of dominance and a concept of separation. And I talk about three or four separations. One is man being separated from God, then man being separated from the universe, man being separated from nature, being separated from himself, the mind and body, uh, and then separated from the apparent other. And what you do when you have that separation, uh, you also have domination. So things that you're separate from, and certainly things that you don't understand or control, you're afraid of, which Dr. King already talked about. Uh, and so in some ways, and I don't mean white people, but the very concept of whiteness is, is uh, deeply embroiled with this sense of fear, anxiety of the other, and dominance. Um, and it seems to me, how do we actually address that, as Dr. King talks about in terms of belovedness? Um, and one of the things I think that's really important that I pull from this work, we have a concept called targeted universalism. And, and I would say, frankly, most people, and I would even say Bernie, don't get the targeted universalism. So King understood that, yes, you have a universal, but you also have a particular. Uh, and too often, of race, 
let's not want to deal with the particularities of Black Life Matters. So you get stuff like, well, Black Life Matters, so the White Life Matters. Um, and what I, what I say is what, what the, the term Black Life Matter really is saying is Black Lives Matter too. Um, and there's never been, as far as I know, and I study this stuff a lot, there's never been a white person killed by police who says, the family, he or she was killed because they're white. And what Black Lives Matter is saying is that these people being killed every day by the police are not because they're criminals, not because they have a gun, not because they're running away, not because they're being killed because they're black. And that requires a special attention. It's a hate crime. In our society, when you kill someone because of their identity, we say it's not just killing, it's killing plus. And so, uh, and to me, the seeds of that, and that's a central part of our work, the targeting universalism. Yes, we have these universal goals, but we have targeted strategies based on how we're situated within structures and culture. Mm. Uh, and too often, because people are uncomfortable sometimes with race, it's like, let's not, let's not, let's not do race. They're, they're, they're very willing to get rid of race and less willing to get rid of racism. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm learning all the time yeah. from my students, from my father, from, uh, uh, you know, I went back just preparing today, reading, rereading King, and I just, I just always amazed how fresh and profound mm. his teachings are. Amen. And we have to learn, right? This is a moment where you can almost still hear the echoes of the gunshots from California where mm. young man was shot in the back in his grandmother's backyard. Shot, and New shot six times, and the police claim he was running toward them, yeah. and they shot him six times in the back. In the back, <laughs> and handcuffed him as he lay on the ground, dying and dead for five minutes wow. um, before yeah. he actually passed away. Or in New York, um, so we continue to grapple with the trauma and the mental health issues in our community. A, a, a young man who was uh, challenged with mental health issues, walking around with a pipe that was bent, um, potentially in the shape of a gun, but who knows? Um, and was, was, was killed on the streets of New York. We have to learn all the so time. So let me just throw two yeah. other things I know. I, I yeah. don't wanna, there was a case, I think it was in Florida, literally, where you talked about mental health, where a black man had a domestic dispute, clearly disturbed, maybe mentally ill. A white policeman shows up, and he actually starts talking him down. I saw this, yeah. And he realized the man has mental illness. Now, a lot of the killings actually involve people with mental illness and race. Um, and he doesn't draw his gun. He's, he's starting to get the man to calm down. His support shows up, two other police. They pull out their gun and kill him. The police who didn't pull out his gun gets fired by the police department. It's like saying, why didn't you pull out your gun and kill this guy? We're going to sanction you for not killing this guy. Now, the good, th the good thing is the ACLU sued and got him a settlement. But what kind of society is it? where you punish people for not killing somebody. Yeah. Mm. Dr. King, what, wow. what has shaped your vision up until this day? Well, I, I would say um, probably more than anything, my Christian faith. Yeah. Um, and not just what I read in, in the Holy Bible, but what I experienced growing up with a mother who was steeped in her faith. Um, she was perhaps the greatest influence um, on my life. She uh, taught us very early on of the value of human life and the importance of unconditional love. Um, I remember so often uh, she would say things like, I don't hold grudges. Um, you know, it's one thing to study something, read something, but it's another thing to experience it because I think um, that cements it for you. And she really cemented this whole forgiveness uh, for me uh, because, you know, unforgiveness is a, is a, is a roadblock. Uh, it disconnects us um, from humanity and uh, I had to go through years of wrestling with that, but having my mother there and knowing about her experiences and of people who hurt her, um, did 
you know, evil things toward her, but yet she still reached out and, and embraced uh, those people. It was very powerful uh, for me. Um, and then she used to say things like, somebody has to cut off the chain of violence. Uh, you know, when you're a child, you don't fully understand all of that. And uh, for us, it's all kids play. If somebody hits me, I'm gonna hit them back. If somebody cusses me out, I'm gonna cuss them back out. Um, if somebody tries to defeat me, um, my goal is to defeat them and win over them. Um, and so over and over again, I just watched her uh, in the way in which she conducted her life. Uh, and then out of that, you know, I, I spent years running away from studying my father, mm. partially because I was called into the ministry. And, uh, and I was called at a young age, I was called at 17. And so as a teenager, I wanted, I wanted my own identity. And so being called to the ministry was like losing that because, you know, my father is this, you know, um, gigantic figure and, and very revered around the world. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to get swallowed up. So even though I went to seminary, I still did not study him. <laughs> Um, and I had one course where I had to study him a little bit. I did go through some of the training uh, early on here at the King Center, but I never went any further. You know, I did whatever was, you know, required at the time. And it really wasn't until perhaps my late 30s um, to early 40s where I really started reading and studying um, him. But now as I approached, him um, because I had those life experiences with my mother, because I went through my own personal journey of hating white people mm -hmm. and especially white males and having to overcome that personally, um, confront that personally and coming to a place where I understand what it means by hate is too great a burden to bear. You know, it's not just a t-shirt that we, you know, we sell the t-shirt, but it's not just words on a t-shirt or on pages. Um, it, it, is, it is real for me because it burdened me down uh, to the point that I was having some physical conditions. Uh, and so, you know, if anybody in here is struggling with that, rid yourself of it because it, it will literally eat you up. Um, and so now, I don't hate. Um, there's no room and space for that. You know, even if I, great and daddy used to say, I'm so happy that Jesus didn't say like everyone. And I was like, amen. Because <laughs> there's just some people you just do not like. <laughs> um, but you know what's amazing for me is that um, when, when, when I look at myself holistically, there are aspects and pieces of me that I don't really care for, you know? But in order to live with me, I had to learn to love me in spite of the aspects of me that I don't like. Um, and so that's helped me in dealing with people because now that I understand that about me and I can't escape me, I can escape other people, then certainly I can love other people wow. in spite of what I don't like. Yeah. Um, and so diving now into this philosophy of nonviolence uh, and methodology of nonviolence is much easier for me to grasp. Um, it's much easier for me to talk about because I'm not now talk, I'm not talking about something that I studied and that's in my head, it's, it's in my heart, it's in my life, it's in my being. Um, and I deeply believe uh, those teachings that my, my father left uh, with us. You know, over and over again as I read them, you know, I have not yet come upon something that I disagree with, yeah. which, you know, can be a little unusual. Um, and maybe some people think it's a little naivete because that's your dad, so you're just kind of, you know, blind to it. But, you know, the deeper and the, the more I study him, the more I'm convinced 
that he's an archetype of Christ um, and that God interjected him in time, on time, uh, because of where we were as a nation and ultimately as a world. Um, the pathway, the trajectory that we were on um, was very dangerous and we're still kind of edging close to that now. And that's why I think God is still allowing his name to be invoked in the universe, um, not to be worshiped, um, but because he is a modern example of what we are to exhibit and exude in this earth, in this, in this human family uh, that we have been uh, born into and that we live as a part of. Wow. wow. How powerful. Amen. And my challenge to you all, let's all begin to rediscover Dr. King with fresh eyes and reread and absorb and, and know, and not just Dr. King, but your mother too. I think one of the most important <laughs> things that we can do over the next decade is to learn more about the life and legacy and work of Coretta Scott King. I, I'm ashamed to say that, uh, that I just found out recently that she went out ahead of your father um, on the Vietnam War and that she was the, the first person to really lead uh, that conversation before passing the baton to, uh, to your father. I, I would love for you all to speak, if you don't mind, uh, one, Dr. King, to your mother's legacy, but, but also just to the importance of women in the movement, uh, an importance that is often overlooked, too often overlooked, but we're beginning to discover more. And as a devotee, and um, I certainly never met her, but um, my, my biggest inspiration in my life is Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, I, 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 I feel like we can't have enough conversations about the importance of, of women in the movement. Would you all mind speaking to that just a bit? Are there individuals who really stand out for you? Um, and certainly, Dr. King, if you'd like to share more about your mother's legacy, please do. Yeah. Well, uh, during the Freedom Summer training, the second week, you, you may remember there were two weeks of the training because it was uh, going for about a thousand students from the north to come south, work in Mississippi, and uh, do voter registration and so on. So it was, the, but the students were divided into two batches. So there was the first week, and then they got on buses and headed for Mississippi, and then the second week. And it was the second day of the second week when um, the, the people up on the stage chatting, you know, among themselves. We were filling the auditorium. We were told we should fill the auditorium. I was sitting over there so I could watch everybody because I'm a sociologist. I got to watch everybody. And so, uh, and, and, but it looked like something very somber was happening. And then someone stepped forward and said, we, there are three people who've been disappeared and uh, they, they are probably dead. And what those students sitting out there in the auditorium needed to realize was, immediately realized was that two of those three had been in those seats the previous week wow. and were already dead. Mm. And so I, with my sociological head on, thought, well, almost everybody here is going to be out of here by the end of the day. Even if they don't want to, their parents are going to call them and saying, we want you home. <laughs> you know, you're not going down there, right? And the women so came through as exemplars of courage, supporting the other students. And I think it was partly because of the willingness for people to feel their feelings. You know, if people just felt like I have to, uh, well, then, but... My mom called, I have to go. No, no, no. It, they, they created an atmosphere. Oh, this is snake workers are very helpful. Uh, we trainers helped. Um, to, and and the, we called off the actual training during the day. There, there were clumps of people around the trees. Guitars came out. It was like prayer meeting. Wow. <laughs> you know, all day long, in which people were processing, what does it mean to go to Mississippi now that we know this? And the women's role in that, I will never forget. I think if, if it had been a male, you know, 500 or so, uh, we would have lost most of them. Wow. <laughs> they kept people around by creating a space for 
healing and then for courage to go out and, and fight the fight. Wow. Sorry. Anyone else want to speak to that? Well, you know, when we start talking about uh, the modern day civil rights movement, um, most people hear um, the name of uh, Rosa Parks, obviously. Um, but most of the figures that we talk about are, are my dad, Ralph Abernathy, um, um, my, my uncle A.D., um, C.T. Vivian, Andrew Young, you know, Joe Lowry. You know, even now, <laughs> when you think about some of the conversations that we have, I'm always saying, I, I, I was looking last night at uh, the uh, C-SPAN, uh, the program they had at the um, was it at the museum yeah. last night? Mm -hmm. And um, I was thinking about God. You would think that there were no women leaders in the movement because the voices that you hear so often now are men, males. Um, and yet, the reason that the boycott occurred was not because of men. It was because of the Women's Political Council who called, had been calling for and looking for an opportunity um, to have that boycott. And this became the moment um, for them to do it. And they were a large part of the contingency of making sure that it had the momentum. You know, had the women not been there, it would have been a two-hour boycott. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all throughout that process, women were all a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were strategists. They sat at tables, too. But, you know, unfortunately, men historically have felt uncomfortable um, with, with women's thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do think, we don't just emote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dr. King, is part of that who was allowed behind the pulpit, right? Because that, that, yeah, was, it was, that was the by that, space the, the that, church, you know, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, especially the Baptist church. Um, uh, we were not as liberated, um, much more today, but still a, an issue. Uh, and so, you know, God, I mean, I can think of so many um, who did so much. You know, Andrew Young often talks about um, my mom and his first wife, Jean Young, and that uh, if they had not married those women, you know, my mom, my dad married Coretta Scott King, him married Jean Young, they probably would never have accomplished what they accomplished um, because they married very strong, secure women, uh, uh, very educated, uh, very dedicated, very um, committed uh, to social change and who perhaps understood nonviolence better than them initially. Um, as you said, my mother worked very early on in the peace movement when she was in college. And so by the time she met my father, he's not the one who brought her along. She was exposed to Gandhi when she was at the Lincoln Normal School when Bayat Rustin uh, came to the school and spoke about Gandhi. My mother was, I think, 16 at the time. And uh, she's two years older than my father. My father's would have been 14 at the time. My father was not yet at Morehouse College. And daddy didn't get exposed to Gandhi until he got to seminary when he was 19, 20. So the early seeds were already there uh, with her. But, you know, women have always been that, that, that force, that glue, um, that critical aspect. And my mother said something very um, important. And she said it in 1968 at um, the Poor People's Campaign in June, 50 years ago. She said, women, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, 
I believe you must become its soul. And, you know, although there's been um, an effort to oppress, repress, suppress, depress, any others, zipress, <laughs> um, a women, uh, the, the reality is that most effective social change throughout the world, if we study it, involve two critical groups, women and youth. There's wow. no escaping it. Wow. So your mom was previewing the Women's March and the Youth March and Tamika Mallory and Bree Newsom and Brittany Packnett and, and so many others who are doing great work. And, and speaking of them, I want to build a bridge to the present day movement today. What is the health of movements for social change today? Are we effectively confronting poverty, racism, and militarism? Where are we strong? Where do we need to grow? Speak to the health of the present day movement, if you wouldn't mind. And from people who I you know, want to be clear are actively still involved in the movement, all three of them, George was arrested last week protesting a utility company in, uh, in, in Philadelphia. Uh, so I'd love for you to speak to the health of the movement as somebody who just got out of jail. So, um, so, <laughs> so but yeah, if you all could talk a little bit about the health of the movement today. Well, I'll start and I'll bridge it with their, your earlier question. And I'll just, first of all, I'll just say, you know, I have a, a really, really wonderful family. And I just left my, my dad, who's uh, 97, wow. uh, been to care for my sister, who's in her 70s. Wow. Um, she just had a serious operation. She lost all her toes, and the family's coming together. I have five sisters. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's hard for me to actually uh, say enough about. Uh, my family and and I think for a lot of us uh, you know not just in terms of movement but uh, our, our exercise our teaching in terms of loving and caring uh, and I know sometimes people don't like that but you know I think my first love was my mom uh, and uh, you know uh, she died uh, almost 20 years ago I still miss her I had so it's just profound. I mean, uh, I won't go into a, a great detail, but you asked about current movements. Two things I want to, two points I want to make. There's a book called The Race Between Education and Technology, uh, written by a couple of Harvard um, economists, actually, one of them's a friend. And they, they point out that the thing that made the United States a powerhouse economically in the 21st century, in the 20th century, was we were the first country that began to didn't do it completely and still haven't done it completely. All those began to bring women into the education arena. So every other country was playing with half a deck. <laughs> and when they start bringing women in in large numbers, things start changing. The country became much more dynamic. You released all of that energy. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. King, I studied the brain. And what any brain science will say, you can't think without emotions. And part of the the scourge of men, especially, you know, uh, some men, is to think that they can lock their emotions down and just think it out. That's not the way the brain works. That's a fiction. Uh, and, the, and the fiction is, and the fiction is so powerful because men tend to be afraid of emotions, as they also are afraid of women. Uh, so they try to lock them down, try to control them. Uh, and it's a good thing they can't, because uh, if they did, we wouldn't have had Alabama in the recent election. Uh, and, and I think most of you knew what happened in Alabama. The establishment of the Democratic Party, and I know this is not political, but here it is. The establishment of the Democratic Party was like, we have to, if we're going to win this election, if the Democrats are going to win, we have to get those Trump voters to come back over and, and uh, vote for Doug Jones. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, what about the black people? Well, you know, you know black people, you know, they're not reliable. I mean, that's, that's, that was the message. Almost until a month before the election. This is in Alabama. Deep, Deeply red state, uh, and they threw a little money at it. But those black women yes. organized, yeah. yes. and they organized uh, with no money, with no help from the national. They organized, and they turned that election around. Uh, and they came out and voted. And not only did they vote, they voted at a higher rate than they did in the midterm election when President Obama was in there, which no one thought they would do. Ninety-eight percent of them voted for Doug Jones. 
And 57% of Doug Jones' support came from black people, and almost all of that was black women. Uh, and so, and I met with some of the women. So, <laughs> you know, uh, and I think that's just emblematic of where we are. And so yes. we, if, if, and I say to people, if people of color, young people, uh -huh. uh, women, if, if we get out there, we can turn this around. The country's in trouble, and not just because of bad policy. The institution's in trouble. The checks and balances are in trouble. The world is in trouble. We have Poland, where people are talking about our, our, our out and out Nazis. Uh, I mean, and if it's going to be turned around, it's going to be turned around in part because of women and the youth and marginalized people. But beyond people, we have to reclaim and reinvigorate institution. I think about how Dr. King's thing about being integrated into a burning house. So we have to put out the fire uh, and, and build something that all of us can belong to. Uh, and that can only be done uh, with the appropriate voice and the appropriate involvement uh, of women and people of color. And I'm going to just throw out one other shout. You mentioned Byron Russell. Um, and I also think people who have different sexual orientation and disabilities, we have to invite them out of the shadow. Yep. Amen. Amen. Health of the movement at this moment of great peril where just to our north, I saw today or yesterday, the Tennessee legislature decided to uh, shoot down a bill that would have done the simple thing of condemning Nazis. And he said, no, we're not, we're not going to move that forward. We're in a very odd, to say it lightly, three minutes, odd space and time right now. What's the health of the movement to fight those types of things? Where, where are we now? Well, I agree with my comrades about the potential that we're seeing, potential manifested uh, by women's activities, by youth activities, the Florida teens, and so on and so on. Uh, and I think that uh, we need to get strategically sharper in order to make the most of those opportunities. For example, it's made such a difference in Philadelphia that we, can see, we framed our campaign with regard to the electrical utility uh, that we're, that we're uh, targeting uh, in, term, in an intersectional way so that our demand combines economic justice, racial justice, and climate justice all at the same time. And that is making such a difference to the character of the campaign. So a lot of the leadership is coming from people of color. And a lot of the uh, participation also is coming from children and teenagers. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a joy to go to jail these days. With, I mean, we don't allow our children to go to jail. But, but they're there. You know, they're, they're there rooting for us. Um, and uh, the, the women, women are are doing you know a lot of the articulation as well as the the actual work. Um, and the the reason why it's such a thriving kind of like our strategy retreats are we look forward to strategy retreats because they cooks at such a high rate of uh, of creativity, uh, and it's all because we think that. If we design these things right, the people who ha whose hearts are in the right place and whose anger is mobilized and whose love is available will will be um, will, will go into the campaigns that can make a difference um, in a united way, and as as the conception of the Poor People's Campaign was right to to bring the unity that's needed. So, but I do think that we need a lot more work on the strategy level. I'm pointing to an example where it's happening, but there are lots of examples where people simply rush out, express an opinion, and rush back and hope that that made a difference. And frankly, friends, I don't think it does. I, 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 it's my field and I can't find examples where the dial has been moved because of a big expression of opinion. It needs to be that sustained, which is what the Civil Rights Movement did, right? Selma, Birmingham, Montgomery, the sustained over time campaign is what really delivers the goods. And, uh, and that's why I'm focusing on this new book. Thank yeah. you. Dr. King, health of the movement. I, I'm just gonna, because I know our time, yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> say ditto to what he just said yeah. about strategy, because I think that's what's severely lacking today. Yeah. Can I just say one other thing? Because I think it's really important. I'm, I'm involved with a lot of the young people and a lot of the movements. One of the things that King really brings to the table is how do you actually have this sharp, strategic engagement and not get consumed by hate? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and King, I, I, I quote him a lot when he's talked about, he, he doesn't say not anger. 
He right. said not hate. Right. In fact, he talked about righteous indignation. Now, and, and I see a lot of indignations that's not righteous. That's right. uh, and so we don't, in, in a lot of movements, we still don't believe we can have a movement that where hate is not sinner. And, and, and when we, people read about King, they think, oh, that was a long time ago. That can't right. happen today. That's the only way it can happen. And that's the only way it can really be sustained. Thank you so much. Have you all enjoyed this conversation, by the way? I believe I have run over, oh, no, so we're going to go out for a couple questions. Wonderful. We have time for just a couple questions. Um, and, uh, and again, hello to everybody on, this, on the stream. Um, we'd love to go out to the audience for a few folks. Yes, ma'am, please. Yes. I, I, I think it's mics. Oh, mics are coming. Mic. Dr. Alveda, can please, you? Please step to this mic if you can. I, I don't think the cord's long enough. I apologize. Yeah, I can hand the seal to one. I, I was thinking especially that Reverend Dr. Bernice might have hit it. One of her dad's scriptures that he taught, and Daddy King and my daddy, was Acts 17, 26. Of one blood, God made all people to live together on the face of the earth. So really, our race, I don't believe it's determined by the color of our skin. But our blood is red. So that didn't come up when we, when we deal with racism. You got the race of the giants, the Nephilims, the Rephrams. Those are different races. But human beings, regardless of skin color or sexuality or all those things, we really are human beings. And that's why I believe we can learn to live together as brothers and sisters and not perish together as fools. But what about religion and science saying that there's one race? It's a, it's a great question. It kind of gets to your point, Dr. Powell, about the construction of whiteness. Um, can we get back to a place? Because, you know, race was a, it is a very real thing now, but it's also a created idea in, 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 in the West. Can, can we get back to a pre race place or is that not our goal and is, is something else our objective yeah I, I i'm always a little concerned when we say back yeah. i think forward <laughs> uh, great point great yes, point. yes and and yes i think we can i mean actually some incredible things are happening if you look at what's called inter relationships which is intermarriage between different races but all so, so diff, different ethnic groups and inter families they're huge people are already doing people are already expressing uh, the ability to love across boundaries. Uh, you know, in, in 1967, the Loving case, a real case where people went to jail, uh, to not for a civil rights movement in this case, but for love. Uh, so I think, yes, we can, uh, but I agree, it's not enough just, we also have to have a strategy, we also have to tell stories, we also have to have examples, and it's helpful to have powerful leaders, um, the King family helping us with this. People, I don't believe people will figure this out on their own because we have too many organized, powerful people on the other side, all the way from the White House who are stirring hate, uh, who are talking about building walls, who we're actually talking about a census that would be a form of ethnic cleansing, you know, uh, where we're really, the, the, the national mood is to reclaim this country for white people. Uh, and so when we challenge that, we have to say, the country's for everybody. You know, white people is fine but along with everybody else. Uh, and, and I think having that clear voice that's powerful uh, and, and strategic and that's grounded in love, uh, I think then I think we can do that. Keeping an eye on the universal, but still a concern for the particular, as you, you said earlier. Uh, questions, yes, please. I just have a comment. I just want to thank the panel for the wealth of information that I have received. Um, I'm originally from Arkansas. Um, I have been in the trenches. Um, my mom is 91, and all she talk about is Dr. King. And so I made it my business to study Dr. King. I have chopped cotton, I have pig cotton. I am an author and a minister. And I say that it can be done because love and faith conquers all. I have been around racism. I have been in the middle of racism, yet my faith saw me through it all. And so I, in, I'm inspired by Dr. King, what he's doing through his daughter. And so I just find it an honor and a privilege. I drove seven hours from Arkansas to get here tonight, just to be here. Thank you so much. Amen. So moving. Thank you so much for your testimony. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay, peace and love. My name is Abel Mabel Thomas. I'm a state representative in Atlanta. Um, what I want to say to um, the panel, excellent, excellent panel, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Bernice King, I want to salute you for the work of, uh, in education and fellowship that you allowed through the programs you've done. But I have this crazy idea that the King family and the King Center is going to have to actually play absolutely full out right now. Because what's going on in the country is so, I don't want to say totally terrible, but it's pretty bad because it's coming from the top. I think that whatever your plans are as it relates to doing this work, it's almost as if you, you got to go to another level of it because the answer to what we're dealing with, I believe, is already written. King done wrote it. King done wrote it. But even though he has written it, some way or another we have to come in to do something that, that takes it, makes it so simplistic, so simplistic, that a kid in the elementary school is going to get it. The middle school kid is going to get it. The high school kid is going to get it. College kid is going to get it. Black Lives Matter is going to get it. People who are professionals who really like to look at sometimes what's going on rather than actively participate in what's going on, they're going to get it. And I think that uh, the work that's being done is good, but I think that you're going to have to do something over and above because nobody is organized like we think they are to take on what we are doing right now. Believe it or not, the King Center is specifically um, positioned for a time such as this. Thank you so much for that comment. And we, cert we certainly agree. The one thing that I'd love for Dr. King to talk you know, about some of the upcoming plans, including the June um, uh, events, but I would also put this back on those sitting here and those tuning in as well. Um, this is a beloved community, and we have, as a community, to invest in this center in this work, and I hope it's not inappropriate for me for me to say that I'm just a, a volunteer like <laughs> like like everyone else. But you know, we have the fifty for fifty campaign, right? And, and what's the website again, Sarah? MLK fifty four. MLK. Oh, let, me, 50, let me make it clear because we say that each time it's MLK five zero forward dot org. MLK five zero forward dot org. Um, the center is doing tremendous work and will continue to do, but its ability to do that work is dependent upon a community rallying around. You've taken a step to, um, to be in, in this place today or to tune in on the stream, but we all have to invest in Dr. King and Mrs. King's vision. Um, we, we've got to go to mlk50forward.org. We've got to return in June and support these events. We've got to find a way um, for, that we can be an asset to uh, this work moving forward. It's not just on, on the King Center, it's on all of us. But I don't know, Dr. And, and that is a particular challenge, so I appreciate you uh, mentioning that. Thank you, Mabel. Abel, Mabel. <laughs> we go a long way back. I appreciate you trying to push us. Um, but. Um, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, um, and, but one of my uh, challenges is I believe that when you step out into something like what you're talking about, you have to have a strong infrastructure um, to stand on. And without us having the, the necessary funding, it makes it difficult. Because just frankly, we have a very lean staff. We don't have every important critical position that we need on this team to do the work that you're talking about. Now, what I'm looking at is how do we form at this point until we get there, how do we form strategic partnerships with organizations that have particular strengths in areas where we're weak? Um, and, and so part of what I will be undertaken over the next, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months is, is looking into that uh, because it, it is a, trust me, it is a heavy burden. Every time something happens, I say to myself, where's our voice? 
And while I can get my voice out there, people don't understand that when I speak, what comes with that is Dr. King. And the demand becomes so enormous that you have to have the infrastructure to support it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, raising money in this nonprofit world is, is like a nightmare because we're saturated with nonprofits. Um, and so for us, it's raising money, it's forming those strategic partnerships um, in order for us to do it. Because I'm, 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 I'm being honest, I, I'm not afraid to go further, but I want to use wisdom in doing it. Yeah. Um, and, and so if anybody has any ideas, if you know some wealthy people, <laughs> um, because there's some things strategically we're trying to do now, one of the things that um, we are undertaking is a thing called beloved com um, community schools. Because I believe that part of changing the trajectory is reaching the next generation. Unfortunately, most of us are so set in stone in our mindset, um, it's hard to uh, change us, change our thinking, um, introduce us to new thoughts. I mean, you know, we stop learning. We just do. We think we've kind of arrived and we're settled in what we believe and that's enough. Um, and so through this beloved community, uh, schools initiative, the idea is to get King into the schools. Um, we have an, a curriculum now uh, that we rolled out with the Atlanta Public Schools from K through uh, five and soon to roll out six through 12, um, an MLK curriculum that also incorporates some of the nonviolent uh, teachings because it's a whole um, frame of reference that we have to introduce. Um, but in order for that thing to roll out at the level we need to, we got to have the funding uh, to roll it out. Um, and, and it's a holistic approach, it's not just the curriculum, there's some other things that we're requiring of those schools um, as well. And, and so we're trying to develop and fine tune our education and our training. But it takes money to do that in this climate. So thank you for asking the question. I accept the challenge, but I agree with my brother Joshua that we also need you and your friends and, and those that are listening, uh, 50 for 50. Everybody can get $50 before the end of this year and support the work that we're doing. Yeah, and I can't think of a more important and valuable project to support. And maybe I'm just an optimist, but instead of thinking about what happens if we don't meet some of these goals, I'm thinking the crazy thought of what if this all came together? What if, what if in this place, this King Center bearing the name and the brand and the legacy of the most important power couple to ever walk the yeah. face of this earth, yeah. what if this was a catalyst for the type of change we need to see, not just in our country, but in our world? I believe that that can happen. That's what I see from my mountaintop. And, and the, um, what I'm gonna, we're going to close with this. I would love for you all to just reflect briefly on Personally, your family, your community, the world, what do you see from your mountaintop right now? If you were behind that pulpit at Mason Temple, what, what as you look out over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, uh, what's your most hopeful vision? What do you want to see? And we'll, we'll start with Dr. Powell, sorry to uh, just spring it on you all <laughs> and go down the list and conclude with Dr. King and then wrap up our conversation. Yeah. Well, so someone said a, a crisis is when the old has died and the new has not yet been born. And so we are in a crisis. Uh, but the new will be born, and what that birth will be. And I think if we think of ourselves as midwives uh, to help that birth, um, now I can be born and be, as you said, what was that, Virginia or Kentucky? What was that that they wouldn't condemn? Oh, Tennessee. Tennessee. It can be born, so it's, it's Nazism. But it also can be born, so it's a beloved community. It's, so we're in a, a state of change. It's not going to go away quickly. It does really require involvement, uh, but it can go either way. And so supporting the King Center, supporting uh, these profound ideas, which is some way of supporting ourselves. And I think if we show up, get involved, be strategic, um, care about each other, we'd be all right. Amen. Show up, get involved, be strategic, and care about each other. Write those four down, because that's going to get us there. George, your mountaintop. Amen to those four. <laughs> and I want to add a fifth, <laughs> which is to be creative. Mm. 
That is to ride the tide and be creative, uh, being willing to be very bold in trying nonviolence, even where it has, where where there are people pushing back and saying that it can't work. I mean, we have seen recent experiments. Uh, I got myself a, a chance to be an unarmed bodyguard to a lawyer in Sri Lanka who was repeatedly being threatened with assassination, and my friend said. That's ridiculous. You can't be an unarmed bodyguard. And I said, yeah, but Dr. King says it's nonviolence. We've got to experiment. George is the most interesting man in the world, by the way. <laughs> He's 80 years old, got arrested last week, and was an unarmed bodyguard in Sri Lanka. Sorry to cut you off, but <laughs> go, 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 go <laughs> but, but, I mean, it's an example of something that is just like, you know, yeah. out there, right? Well, that will never work. But the civil rights movement would never work, you know, with without local law enforcement. Uh, uh, I mean, against local law enforcement, against the state, against the federal government sometimes. And it did work, you know? It, it, it's that, mm. that daring to be creative and to go where no one has gone before. And I would make that the fifth step as well. Wonderful. Dr. King. And real quick, my father was a prophet, but he said something that I hope we prove him wrong he said, one of the tragedies of human history is that the children of darkness are often more zealous and determined than the children of light. Mm. From my mountaintop, starting with Black Lives Matter to march for our lives, I see the children of light becoming more resolute, vigilant, Amen. and determined. Yeah, say that, say that. Well, friends, we have had a wonderful conversation. Give it up for Dr. Bernice King, George Lakey, and Dr. John Powell. Come back tomorrow for all of the phenomenal panels and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all so much. Bless Thank you. Thank you all. Strahan. I'm Bernice A. King. The day before my father was assassinated, he shared his vision for the future. His mountaintop vision still gives millions of Americans hope. And from my mountaintop. From my mountaintop. From my mountaintop. I see a global community that realizes our interconnectedness. I see a critical mass of humanity moving in the direction of a more peaceful, just, and joyful world. The acceptance of all colors, creeds, sexual preferences. You really need people of character that are willing to stand up and stand out. Everybody in this world has value. And that's my view from the mountaintop. And that's a beautiful thing.